uh, one of those scientists with really diverse interests and way too much enthusiasm. Um, but he's always inspiring to talk to, so I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. He uh, has been at a number of dis different institutions over the years. He was trained at Yale, and then we knew each other from grad school at Cornell. And then he did a Miller Fellowship at Berkeley. And after that, he had positions at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and then uh, the City University of New York, um, Hunter College, where he was also like the vice provost chancellor of all research. He was really into administration. And despite all that administrative work, he continued to be incredibly productive. So now he's the Harley Jones von Cleese Professor of Host Parasite Interactions at the University of Illinois. He's uh, published over 250 papers. He wrote this fantastic book on bird eggs. I'm sure during this talk, you'll see some of his amazing pictures. Before talking to him, I did not realize how diverse bird eggs were. You know, you just figure kind of they're white or something, but no, bird eggs, so cool. Who knew? Um, he's also editor-in-chief of the journal Auk, and he was a fellow in the Human Frontier Science Program, which does uh, it funds cutting-edge interdisciplinary research. But I think Mark's biggest claim to fame is that he pioneered the use of magic markers to uh, color bird feathers. In grad school, I remember he spent a lot of time like coloring birds with magic markers to study their recognition behavior, and he found super cool results. And I feel like we're kind of kindred spirits since I'm best known for painting wasps with toothpicks. Um, so uh, I really appreciate that he has creative methods, everything from like the fanciest bird imaging to magic markers to find cool stuff. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. Thank you, Liz. Thanks so much. Uh, um, it's an honor to be at Michigan, uh, which is my, I'm trying to be PC here, my academic grandparenthood. Uh, uh, so both of my uh, PhD advisors went to uh, grad school here, and my postdoc advisor went to grad school here. So uh, I feel like uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm an honored uh, uh, position to, uh, to follow the, um, their, their strategies and their uh, their pathways, and I remember they were terrified of things like first exams and other things, but I hear the life has become better for graduate students here, so <laughs> if you're taking your first exam, just ignore me. Um, I, uh, I also uh, uh, have some of my heroes working here, uh, uh, um, you know, um, Bob Payne is in, in the audience and, uh, and he's really been a motivation for me. Uh, in 1996, I wrote him an email and I said, do you know anything about the neurobiological basis of being a parasite? And uh, Bob wrote back to me and said, no, I don't know anything about that. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I knew that there was a topic for me to study. If Bob Payne, you know, thought that it was uh, it was an open field, then I should be able to do that. And I've been doing the exact same thing ever since. Uh, in fact, that's the only thing NSF has ever funded me for um, in, th in three different occasions. So thank you, Bob. Um, I wanted to thank my students and my, uh, uh, my colleagues for uh, doing all the, uh, uh, the, the exciting uh, uh, collaborations uh, with me. Uh, when I lived in New Zealand, I was very far from civilization. Uh, New Zealand is a beautiful place for, uh, full of birds, but uh, no, anybody from New Zealand here? All right, so anyways, it's far from everywhere else, but it's wonderful for birds. But if you want to keep track of uh, what's going on in the world, you have to collaborate with people. And so I had collaborators from Europe, from North America, from South America, from Australia along the way. And my students uh, you know, uh, deserve all the credit uh, 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 they take some of the ideas I had, they, they contradict some of the ideas I had, uh, they generate uh, uh, most of the ideas uh, that we came credit for, and, uh, and they do uh, a lot of the work in the lab uh, uh, when it's not a collaboration but a, a lab work based uh, project. Um, I used to be able to say that, uh, that I study birds because they are a wonderful model system for you know, other questions, but uh, um, I can just now say that I like birds. And, uh, and I wanted to study them because they have an incredible life history diversity when it comes to social parasitism. Other than insects uh, and the, the, the parasitic catfish, uh, uh, social parasitism uh, amongst vertebrates and, uh, and amongst uh, invertebrates is, is best studied among brood parasitic birds. And so for my PhD, I studied the question that, uh, uh, that Liz mentioned, is self-referent phenotype matching. Because when you're a brood parasite and you lay your eggs in other birds' nests, and then you grow up together with other species, like this cowbird in a nest of a Phoebe, and you are being fed and raised by that Phoebe, how do you become a highly social cowbird? How do you know what other cowbirds are like? How come you don't misimprint on the whole species? 
and how do you recognize your own uh, 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 conspecifics as, uh, as potential social partners. Uh, um, so you can be a brood parasite in many different ways. You can be intraspecific brood parasite, where you could be a red-headed duck and uh, parasitize other red-headed ducks uh, within your own species. You could be parasitizing canvasback ducks, uh, heterospecifically, but you could also just build your own nest and lay your own eggs and incubate your own eggs uh, um, as a facultative parasite does. Uh, you could be an interspecific brood parasite uh, 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 by being obligate uh, brood parasite. You always lay your eggs in other birds' nests uh, if you're a bird. Uh, or you could be facultative uh, and again be that uh, be like that redhead uh, that I mentioned before. You can be a catfish uh, as a brood parasite, and this is a hard job because you have to sneak your egg into a mouse brooding uh, uh, cichlids, uh, uh, a breeding attempt, and this is an externally fertilizing species. So as, as a female, you have to have a male uh, working with you to parasitize those cichlids. Uh, 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 and uh, if you've ever seen footage of the catfish parasitizing cichlids, it's pretty exciting. There's just like 15 different things happening at the same time. Uh, you could be a slave-making ant and, uh, and using the workers and the, the brood uh, uh, of, uh, of other species to, uh, uh, in, in uh, purpose of uh, raising your own brood and your own colony. Or you could be a cuckoo's cuckoo parasitizing host whose eggs are so similar to your own eggs that it's really difficult to tell apart both when you're a researcher and when you're a host species. Uh, um, you could study uh, even uh, brood parasitism for its many natural history uh, curiosities, but you could also use it as a model system for co-evolution interactions, for the proximate basis of such uh, interactions, what is the genetics of, uh, of uh, selectivity in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, co-evolutionary systems. Uh, you could study them for conservation biology. This is the state where uh, uh, you could source cowbirds relatively easily by going to the Kirtland warbler uh, uh, sites and, uh, and trapping uh, cowbirds uh, um, until uh, uh, there are no more cowbirds to parasitize the Kirtland warblers. Apparently this year there were no parasitized nests of Kirtland warblers by the cowbirds themselves. Uh, um, you could study global change and human impacts. Uh, cowbirds and cuckoos have uh, undergone uh, a major anthropogenic uh, or global change relevant uh, uh, um, range expect expansions. Uh, you can now find Eurasian cuckoos in Alaska. Uh, we haven't found the first cuckoo egg yet, but they have been seen mating. They have been there in the, in the summertime. And in fact, one cuckoo uh, uh, accidentally migrated to, uh, um, to the west coast of California rather than uh, 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 through uh, uh, Kamchatka and, uh, and its Asian migratory route. And uh, right now, we're also working on the genomic basis of being a brood parasite, comparing uh, brood parasitic uh, lineages with non-parasitic lineages. There's about seven independent origins of brood parasitism among birds. And so it gives us a little bit of a, a power to study what is the genomic innovation of uh, becoming a brood parasite itself. But really the most exciting question for me in the beginning was how do you become a cowbird? How do you know who you are? Uh, um, and in fact, this kind of question led me to become a psychologist and the developmental uh, biopsychologist asking questions about social recognition system. Uh, um, when I started my work, uh, um, there were about 3,000 papers on brown-headed cowbirds. Uh, uh, but the, this question about how your species recognition comes about was relatively unknown. Uh, there were a couple uh, uh, mentions by Catherine Ortega in her book and Nick Davis by his book that, that species recognition in cowbirds is, is, is done through genetics. But of course, from the, the work of uh, uh, um, 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 uh, the, the pain lab, we know that, uh, that there's a lot of learning involved in species recognition in other brood parasitic lineage as well. And so we started asking the question, well, maybe there is such a thing as self-referencing, the armpit effect that Dawkins called uh, uh, in, in cowbirds. Maybe they recognize their self by inspecting their own phenotype and, uh, and socializing with other individuals that match their own phenotype. Uh, uh, there are some other al alternatives like the password-based vocal recognition, ecologically mediated habitat specificity or foraging-based uh, socialization with conspecifics, and there's some evidence for some of those, uh, those papers as well. Um, when I started studying cowbirds, I, 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 you know, I wanted to be as uh, a genuine and ornithologist as possible, so I studied song sparrows which nest in these uh, 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 sort of uh, slightly modified habitats, but they got depredated all the time. In one year, I had 80% depredation thanks to grackles and snakes uh, in my study site. So I did what you know an armchair ornithologist does. You put an ad in the paper, and I said, I'm looking for bird nests. I'm looking for Phoebe nests in Ithaca, and about 100 people called me up uh, 
uh, uh, after having read the pet section of the Ithaca Journal. This was before Craigslist and the internet or anything like that. Uh, so there were lots of people reading the pet section in Ithaca, uh, I learned that. Uh, it turns out that Phoebes, uh, although they nest in natural sites, uh, they typically nest under eaves and, uh, and uh, bridges and uh, inside barns and uh, uh, um, other human-made structures. And so it was relatively easy to source cowbirds and hand raise them in captivity and ask questions about their social development uh, along the way. This is a young cowbird uh, already full of crop uh, and still begging uh, because that's what cowbirds do. They are, even when they are satiated, they continue begging. The experiment was straightforward. I wanted to manipulate the appearance of the cowbirds to ask the question whether you will socialize with experimentally manipulated appearances or uh, experimentally controlled appearances. And so this is what a male cowbird looks like, brown headed cowbird, this is what a female looks like, a juvenile. And this is what a painted female looks like with that uh, magic marker that Liz mentioned and a painted juvenile. Uh, these are not highly photogenic birds, I may have to mention that. Uh, the control birds were dyed under the, 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 uh, the, the wings to make sure that they were exposed to the chemicals and the scent of, uh, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the pigment in, uh, um, in the magic marker. Uh, this is what uh, reflectance spectrometry looks like uh, uh, of the, the manipulated birds and unmanipulated birds. So this is what the juvenile feathers look like, the female feathers. And so we didn't make the birds look like males, we just made them similar to each other the painted females and the painted juveniles. Uh, we gave them a choice trial uh, and we had a neutral zone so the bird could either sit here or socialize with a stimulus that looked like itself and a stimulus that looked like uh, the control and we just looked at how much active choice is taking place in these, uh, in these scenarios. And so what the, these data show us is, is uh, when the, the graph is, uh, is more positive, it means that they associated more with the painted phenotype and when the, the, uh, the graph is more negative, they associate it with the control phenotype. And so the painted birds had a sex-specific effect, but also a treatment effect. They associated more with the painted phenotype. Dawkins was right. There is such a thing as the self-referent phenotype matching uh, in cowbirds themselves. And in fact, to this date, these are one of the few data sets where the actual cue was manipulated, much like Liz manipulates the social recognition cues in her system. Uh, 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 th uh, uh, this is the, the few cases, unlike mammalian systems, where cross-fostering is the main method for self-referent phenotype matching to show that the cue actually is color itself. Uh, we also uh, tested the idea that um, it's, you have to find a uh, uh, flux of cowbirds or potential mates, and uh, how do you find them over the long distance? And one possibility is use, uh, to use a vocalization, such as the chatter call. And so this is... This is the chatter call or the rattle call of the cowbird. And what we saw is that even juvenile birds, uh, five days uh, uh, after hatching and, and, uh, and uh, 15 days after fledging, associated with this vocalization. And they, uh, they start learning about being a cowbird after they join a flock of cowbirds. But in this, uh, this initial vocalization is something that, that specifies the cowbird species identi uh, identity over long distance well before the visual cues are, uh, are available to them. And so, so I asked the question in 1996 from Bob Payne, you know, what are the neurobiological bases of being a brood parasite? It took us until on 2017, uh, so a few years later, to actually look at the neural bases of chatter recognition in, uh, in juvenile versus adult cowbirds. And so we look at auditory brain areas such as NCM, and CM, which are the secondary auditory cortex of the, of the songbird brain. And what I wanted to highlight here is that um, the CMM region of the juveniles, the hatchier birds, uh, is not selective for, uh, for the chatter call itself, but the NCM, these birds that have heard very little chatter call in their early development, are uh, uh, selective for, uh, uh, for the conspecific uh, uh, chatter call and not for the heterospecific uh, call, which was a dove, uh, a coo uh, type of vocalization. So it looks like uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, the NCM itself is already uh, 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 encoding the specificity for a cowbird specific vocalization in the brain of the, wor the, wor the, 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 the young bird versus CM has to do with the uh, learned components of uh, both conspecific songs and conspecific chatters in this, uh, in this system. Uh, um, when I visited uh, 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 Michigan in 2001 for the first time, I learned about uh, 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 the genus Vidua and, uh, and all their wonderful adaptations for being brood parasites, such as the, the gate mimetic patterns of uh, the host and the parasite. Uh, um, and in fact, our colleague uh, Justin Schutz took a magic marker and painted over these white uh, markings and showed that when 
you're, uh, uh, you're uh, uh, manipulated, uh, you are fed less by the parents themselves, so uh, uh, there is discrimination against non-mimetic uh, gape, uh, gape patterns in this species. Um, but I also wanted to, to sort of use this system to identify whether uh, 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 they are that different from their sister lineage, which is the astralid finches and specifically the zebra finch itself. And so we knew how to analyze the, visu the, the auditory selectivity of the zebra finch brain using functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, um, and uh, fortunately, the widers have, uh, the pintailed widers have a very similar head size. Uh, the neck is a little different, so sometimes the, the machine didn't quite work, but their head, uh, uh, their brain size is quite similar. And so we can look at uh, uh, brain activation inside of uh, an MRI during auditory playback across the whole brain itself, uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, areas of, uh, of uh, neural activation as measured by the bold response, uh, the, the oxygenated uh, 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 blood response. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is you don't have to kill your subjects to get the data. The, unlike that cardboard data set I showed you where you, know, you have to chop off the brain for this kind of work. Uh, and what we found is that, um, that much like the behavior, the responses to conspecific songs, in behavior versus heterospecific songs, the fMRI response, which was the maximum activation of the, of the bold response in the auditory forebrain field, L, CM, and NCM, uh, uh, was greater for conspecific versus heterospecific uh, signals, which su suggests that the, the Y does use the exact same uh, 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 neural mechanism for species recognition as what we have known from the, y from the zebra finches before. So parental versus non-parental systems are similar in their, uh, in their uh, neuroanatomical basis of the signal recognition, but different perhaps in the timing as we've seen in the cowbirds themselves. So this is, this, this is you know, sort of uh, where my interests have lied. And then I thought, you know, when I became a faculty member, I should study something else. And, and apparently NSF didn't think of that much. Uh, and so I applied uh, for NSF grants about 31 times before I went back to my PhD question and got funded. So, uh, so what I'll, you'll see in the next set of slides is, is ideas that I had, but NSF didn't like. Um, but, uh, but the publishers like them, so I'm going to tell you about them anyway. So, um, so brute parasites are a wonderful model system for co-evolution interactions, theoretically. You have heard this statement without the theoretical uh, uh, um, a connotation uh, uh, before, because um, you know, Nick Davis has, uh, has a numerous number of uh, uh, um, um, nature papers about it. Uh, 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 and you've read about it in textbooks. It turns out that we are only missing two things about showing that, uh, that host parasite interaction in birds are, are actually a co-evolved system. It's about the genetic basis of the perceptual basis of recognizing the, the, the parasites, and it's about the genetic basis of, uh, of uh, 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 building a mimetic egg inside the oviduct of the, of the, of the host, of the parasite that, that lays the mimetic egg. So we're only missing the genetics of these co-evolutionary interactions, and hopefully, in the next 20 years, we will, uh, we will be able to answer that, uh, that gap. Uh, uh, but, but root parasitism is costly. This is what happens. This is a young common cuckoo in Europe uh, in the nest of a great red warbler, tossing out that, uh, that reproductive success of the, of, the, of the host itself. This is egg number one uh, uh, that's, uh, that's about to be tossed out. This is mom, great red warbler, watching her fitness diminish right in front of her eyes. And I used to work in a psychology department in New York, and you know, people said, well, why am I studying such slow birds that are unable to tell that their fitness is being diminished in front of uh, uh, their very existence? Um, and this is a fair question, because the hosts of most brood parasites that don't reject eggs are actually uh, um, uh, uh, have incredible motor skills. Uh, these are red starts uh, 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 in Europe, uh, common red starts in uh, Finland and uh, eastern Phoebes in North America, parasitized by cuckoos versus uh, cowbirds. Uh, this is a white eye, uh, uh, a white head in, uh, in New Zealand being parasitized by a long-tailed cuckoo here. Um, how come these birds can tell apart the, the fact that they are being parasitized when they have incredible uh, 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 foraging and, uh, and, uh, and, and migratory adaptations? Uh, red stars will come back and nest in the same nest box uh, after having migrated uh, uh, several thousands of kilometers to Africa. Phoebes will come back and, and rebuild the nest at the exact same spot where their nest was built in the previous year, even if you move the previous year's nest just one meter to the east or one meter to the west or north or east from the previous location. They will exactly remember the, the site. And these are both 
species, red stars and uh, phoebes that, that sally for flying insects in midair, how come they can't tell the difference between their own eggs and other birds' nests? And, the, and it turns out that a lot of birds can tell the difference, uh, 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 or they can, they can respond to brute parasitism by things like attacking the parasitic uh, cuckoo or a model cuckoo in the cover of this bird fighting magazine, you know, published by some, some strange British people. Uh, uh, um, there are birds that, uh, that are rejecting the nestlings themselves, or in the case of some sparrows, they can't uh, reject the cowbird egg itself. Perhaps their beak is too small for rejection, or they can't recognize the cowbird egg itself, but they will abandon the nest. Uh, we just published a paper showing that shipping sparrows will not recognize the fact that they are parasitized if you put a cowbird egg in the nest, but if you put a cowbird model next to the nest, they will abandon the nesting attempt. They respond to the image of the model cowbird or the ad actual adult cowbird rather than the parasitism event inside the nest itself. Uh, but some birds can do by ejecting or marginalizing parasitic eggs. Uh, you saw the parasitic chick rejection here, or even parasitizing the, 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 the par or uh, discriminating the parasitic fledglings. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of uh, um, the South American cowbird system. This is the, the host, the, the bay wing. Uh, this is the parasite, the screaming cowbird. And this is a generalist parasite, the shiny cowbird. And, uh, and this bird uh, looks nothing like this one as, as an adult, but it, it looks very much like the host uh, in the case of the fledging stage. Uh, uh, when these birds fledge, uh, they both can survive in the nest because it's a no dark nest. The, birds can, the host can discriminate them. But at the fledging stage, this bird will not be fed by the parents. This bird will fe be fed by the foster parents themselves. Um, and and so, so if you look at the origin of avian brood parasitism and the diversity, um, the type of mimicry, the type of uh, responses to the host will vary according to these stages. Uh, uh, this is just a slide to remind me that, uh, that uh, when you have funding from the Human Frontier Science Program, you can travel to any continent uh, and claim that you're studying brood parasites. Uh, uh, there's brood parasites in Africa, South America, the ducks, the, the South American cuckoos, uh, uh, North America. There are now widows introduced to Puerto Rico, and uh, just yesterday I was interviewed by the Miami Herald after apparently a hurricane uh, uh, season. Uh, there are widows flying around in South Florida now. Fortunately, there's no astrildids established for them to parasitize there. Uh, you can study parasites in Africa, in Asia, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, in Australia, as I mentioned. And you can study them by becoming older and wiser as the years go on. Uh, so this is just my development over the last 20 years studying brood parasites along the way. Um, this is the only slide you will ever need to know about brood parasites, so I'm going to step here and explain to you. Um, this was the system I mentioned. This is the host, the bay wing. This is the parasite, the screaming cowbird. But this is what the fledgling parasite looks like. And um, I wish people had done the magic marker experiment to cover up these feathers, but you know the prediction is death. And so instead, they just use shiny cowbirds as you know as subjects to die in the cross fostering study. So these fledglings are not mimetic; they will not be fed. These fledglings are mimetic; they will be fed. Uh, uh, um, there's, uh, the, I talked about the gate mimicry pattern in the widers and the astrildid hosts. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, a, a spectrophotometry uh, comparison of cuckoos versus hosts. When the host uh, has a black, yellow, or pink skin, so does the cuckoo. You don't need spectrophotometry to show it's mimetic. And when I lived in New Zealand, there was no visual mimicry whatsoever. This is what the, the cuckoo chick looks like. It's not mimetic in the gate pattern. It's not mimetic in the skin pattern. But what it's mimetic in is the begging call. And so this is the begging call of one of the hosts. This is the begging call of a second host. And this is the begging call of the cuckoo. And so, so you here see the, the begging calls of the, of the two host species and the, the, the cuckoo itself, uh, the long-tailed cuckoo. It's, it's quite mimetic. Uh, 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 in its uh, acoustic appearance. Uh, I'm going to play the second cuckoo in New Zealand, which is the shining cuckoo and its begging call. And this is the, 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 uh, spectro uh, uh, the, the spectrogram for it. And this is what the host sounds like. And again, you don't need extensive acoustic analysis, although we've done it, that this is a, a single tone uh, or a double tone uh, for 8 kilohertz so vocalizations. Uh, the, the parasites are much more resembling the, the begging calls of the host than each other, suggesting some sort of uh, vocal mimicry uh, uh, itself. 
But the, the most famous part of, uh, of the brute parasitic story is, of course, uh, the, the, the ejection or the marginalizing of the parasitic eggs. Uh, a lot of hosts, especially in the European cuckoo systems, are famous for uh, uh, detecting the odd-looking egg in the nest and tossing it out. And the, caber and the, and the, the cuckoos are known for uh, their increasing limetic eggs. But even in your backyard here in North America, the robins are one of the few species that are actually very good at rejecting cowbird eggs. And this is just a video from Spencer Seeley's research group on a robin responding to a cowbird egg inside the nest. There's a cowbird egg. This is it. This is what we study. It's about three seconds, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's highly exciting to watch it, but, you know, it doesn't happen during the first hour typically. Uh, unless you're a cuckoo in, uh, unless you're a robin in, uh, in New York, this is a nest next to the Imagine sign uh, by John Lennon, and this is a, a robin that flew straight at me while calling and attacking me. Uh, this is a bird that lives next to about 10,000 tourists visiting this, this site. Uh, this is the difference between Canadian robins, which are nice and gentle, and, <laughs> and New York City robins. Um, so we use the magic markers to color the eggs themselves. Uh, uh, so these are some of our uh, 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 painted or magic marker manipulated eggs. Um, we actually started uh, um, uh, using 3D printed eggs because you could mimic the shape uh, um, and the size of the eggs much easier. And so what you see here is um, a terrible correlation. It's a positive relationship. So the greater the distance between the robin's own egg and the, the artificial egg or uh, other types of egg, the, the greater the rejection rate. This, uh, the rejection rate varies from 0 to 100%. Uh, to, to and there's kind of a, sl a positive slope, but it's terrible positive slope. In fact, the, uh, the, the cowbird's own egg you know, doesn't fall into this, uh, into this error region, and the robin's own egg doesn't fall into it. So, so we have a positive relationship that, that just has a really poor R squared value. Uh. And so we wanted to ask the question, well, what's, what's wrong with our ability to study the egg rejection abilities of, uh, of robins, um, and what's wrong with actually using magic markers in this system? Uh, I have finally come to a, a, a place where magic markers have limitations. So first we wanted to ask the question, maybe, maybe the egg rejecting hosts are just visually more sensitive. They have ultraviolet vision compared to violet sensitive vision. Uh, uh, um, many passerines have violet sensitive vision. Uh, 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 some of the fairy ants, for instance, do. Uh, uh, um, of course, all the sub are signs uh, uh, that we know of uh, uh, have uh, violet sensitive vision. But, uh, but among uh, uh, our signs, we have a variation. And so we wanted to look at, you know, maybe egg rejector species have ultraviolet sensitive vision and rejectors and acceptor species have violet sensitive vision, but it looks like uh, amongst even the small sample size or a greater sample size, there's no relationship between having a violet or ultraviolet sensitive opsin gene and egg rejection ability. Uh, so it's not about uh, your, your uh, um, genetic uh, uh, visual system. Of course, the, the genetics doesn't tell you everything because birds see color in, in many more different ways than we do. Uh, and color droplet and, and visual uh, uh, pigment distribution are also important. Uh, um, so then, then we wanted to ask the question, uh, what, happens, uh, uh, what happens in a mimetic system? So the robin system isn't, uh, you know, isn't mimetic. The cowbird egg is beige uh, and speckled, and, uh, and the robin egg is clear blue. You know, it's no, no surprise that the robin should be able to tell that egg apart. Uh, but what about the, a mimetic system, like the common cuckoo in Hungary and the great red warbler? And this is the cuckoo egg here, and these are the host eggs. And uh, we wanted to, to use spectrophotometry to ask the question, how mimetic, how good is this mimicry itself in it? And so, so I could show you all the photographs in the world, but you really have to do full spectrum uh, uh, spectrophotometry, uh, uh, reflectance uh, measurements to, in the UV region and in the, the human visible region to show that the shape of this curve, not the height, which is the brightness, but the shape of this curve is very similar. And when you plug it into the visual perceptual system of the bird and calculate just noticeable differences, the chromatic distances, the color background, the beige color is non-discriminable. The value is less than one, which suggests the, 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 red, the gray treed warblers should not be able to tell the difference between the, the, the background of their own eggs and the background of the, of the cuckoo egg itself. So we wanted to ask uh, a question uh, uh, about the mechanism of this mimicry. And so this is the first million dollars that the Human uh, Science 
Frontiers program gave us, uh, and we asked the question, how do you achieve perceptual mimicry? Do you achieve it by replicating the pigment that cause color in bird eggs, or do you just achieve perceptual mimicry like we do with the magic markers? And the answer to the million dollar question is no. Uh, uh, you will replicate the pigments itself. You know, that was, that was uh, four years of study of figuring out what are the pigments that cause different bird egg colors, uh, uh, collecting the samples from the different cuckoo systems. So this is a cuckoo egg in a red start nest, this is a cuckoo egg in a reed warbler, cuckoo egg in the great reed warbler. And what these graphs show you that both the biliverdin, the pigments responsible for the blue, pig blue coloration, and protoporphyrin, the pigments responsible for the brown speckling, are similar between the host and their respective host trace of the cuckoo, and this different between different host traces of the cuckoo themselves. Uh, so this is the, the pigment of the, of the cuckoo itself, uh, 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 and, uh, and the, the great reed warbler, the cuckoo and the, the, the red start, and the cuckoo and the parasitizing the reed warbler itself uh, 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 right there. And in fact, this is not surprising because most bird eggs are caused by two pigments alone. Uh, this is actually a, 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 an extinct bird's uh, uh, egg. This is a, a, an upland moa egg from New Zealand. And, uh, and when you study birds in New Zealand, there's only about eight or 10 colleagues in the whole country. It's a, small, it's a small country. And so you travel to the one museum that holds the green egg and you ask the, the curator, can you please give me a piece of this eggshell so I can destroy it in sulfuric acid? And, uh, and his answer is no, you can't do that. Um, but then you go to the box which housed this egg and you find a tiny little fragment on the bottom of the box and you ask the, the, the curator, can I please have this fragment on the bottom of the box? And he says, I, you know, it looks like it's a moag, but I don't actually know. And so he gives you that fragment and you study the pigment composition. And sure enough, even the green egg laying extinct moas use uh, a, a biliverd to color their eggs. It turns out that you could just use non-destructive methods now. And we published a paper on this using uh, uh, um, Raman uh, uh, um, 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 spectrometry, uh, so you could just shine you know, a laser at the shell, not destroy it, and uh, it tells you the same question. So stop destroying actual set fragments, uh, which is the message of my lecture. Um, so because I started studying these eggs, uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, um, I, I became known for eggs uh, um, uh, amongst my colleagues, and uh, I got a chance to write a book on eggs uh, and and uh, we have this incredible cover which you know tells you about the diversity of the eggshells. But I actually want to, to tell you that eggshells are really boring. Um, and I will tell you why. It's because this is it. This is the diversity of eggshells. You have blue eggs, you have brown eggs, and you have speckled eggs. And that's it. When you have two pigments and the white color of the calcium carbonate, this is all you can have. Of course, the patterning itself is, is, is highly attractive to us. And, and we are yet to quantify the diversity of eggshell patterning itself. We have mechanisms, or we have methods in R and, uh, and other programs to quantify patterns. Uh, uh, and it's the combination of the pattern and the color that generates that diversity that, that uh, 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 Liz has mentioned. But the background colors themselves are relatively boring when you compare them to things like feather colors and things like uh, a plant coloration, flowers and foliage and bark coloration itself. So this is what avian perceptual space looks like when you look at uh, 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 feather colors, uh, which is the blue, or when you look at flower colors, which is the red coloration. It fills out perceptual space quite well, and these are all colors that theoretically can be perceived by the birds. This is what, uh, what feather color or egg coloration looks like. I just call it the, the egg color sausage. You know, I, just, I, I really just want you to like compare. Like, this, is, this is like, uh, the tetrachromatic space, this is it. This is like this tiny little sausage of blue and brown eggs. Uh, um, and so, so um, you can recreate this color by, uh, by just taking the two pigments and theoretically mixing up with the white of the, of the, uh, the egg color itself. Um, um, and so, so we didn't know this when we started using the magic markers. Uh, we started uh, coloring eggs in, in you know, ways that we thought were were uh, relevant uh, you know, or not relevant. You know, we thought that maybe the yellow colors you know, suggested the York spillage over the eggs and the blues and the greens resembled the bluish green hues of the eggs themselves. Uh, 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 but but you know, we've become, you know, fortunately uh, with this funding, uh, much more sophisticated. But initially the results were, especially for this mi mimetic system, the great red warbler and the cuckoo, quite positive. So again, these are positive correlations that I'm showing 
between the distance that's perceivable by the bird's eyes from the bird's own eggs versus these artificial eggs that we generated. And when you put on the error bars uh, 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 or, uh, or, or just the estimation, the cuckoo egg is, you know, falls quite closely to this positive line in these metrics, and, uh, and so does the rejection of the host egg eggs. Uh. So, so, but again, if you look at the R square or just the variance, it's, it's really unsatisfactory. Uh. Uh, for instance, look at the rejection rates of the blue eggs versus the green eggs. There's a, there's a J and D difference of two, which is basically visible versus non-visible, non-visible versus visible difference. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at uh, the difference between green eggs and yellow eggs, there's a, there's a 40% egg rejection rate, even though the J and Ds are quite similar to each other. So we started asking a question, maybe there's a so context, a social context to this recognition uh, that we're not ac a a uh, accounting for. And in fact, if you put a cuckoo model next to the bird, uh, next to, uh, uh, next to the, the, the grated warbler, the reed warbler nest, they start rejecting eggs more often. Uh, we called it uh, the, a shift of the conspecific acceptance threshold. Uh, you basically uh, uh, increase the potential danger by having the risk of having more foreign eggs in the nest by having a cuckoo right next door. And, uh, and because of that, you should become more discriminating in your uh, acceptance threshold. So we tested this hypothesis not using the color, but the, 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 the maculation patterns. And so we knew that the background color had important effects from the, the magic marker study. So we had control eggs, we had speckled eggs, which still retained the background color, and we had all brown eggs. And the initial stage of the experiment is, is really quite straightforward. They accept most of the speckled eggs, and they reject most of the brown eggs. This is not what the experiment is. The experiment is what happens when you put a speckled egg into a clutch where the birds have already rejected the brown egg itself. Uh, according to the optimal acceptance threshold shift hypothesis, you should start rejecting this egg because the risk of parasitism is known to have increased by having a foreign egg in the nest itself. And in fact, that's what we found. The exact same phenotype that accepted most of the time is now rejected most of the time, suggesting that birds can see more than they actually take decisions upon. They can tell that this egg is a foreign egg, but they, may, they decide not to reject it. Uh, um, and those are potentially related to costs of, of recognizing your own eggs and rejecting your own eggs uh, in the process itself. Uh, um, so so if, you, if you look at these two different systems, uh, uh, you find a case where the, 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 the cases where most of the, of the cowbird hosts don't reject the eggs like the Phoebes or the song sparrows. Uh, 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 have quite dissimilar looking eggs in the nest, and uh, in most of the cases, the cuckoos, where the hosts do reject non mimetic eggs, uh, 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 the, the cuckoo egg is highly mimetic, like the case of the red start or the, uh, um, or the grated warbler cases here. So, so the, the, the pattern of, uh, of, of mimicry and parasitism matters, but also uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the species identity of the host matters. So I wanted to come back to this, uh, to this case. So until now, we've been talking about you know, eggs and differences between the eggs. And at some point in your career, you want to write the one paper which disproves everybody. You want to be known as the person who brought down the major hypothesis in the field. And so I said, well, it turns out that, uh, that this could be another metric. This is correlated with not only the difference between the bird's own eggs and, uh, and uh, the experimental egg, but it's also, uh, um, it's also correlated with, uh, with other things, such as contrast or the diversity of the eggs themselves. Or perhaps these colors are not uh, uh, describing uh, the actual color diversity that the birds are paying attention to. So I, I wanted to bring, back to bring you back to this example where the bird's natural egg diversity is very limited in its color appearance. And so we decided to, to print artificial eggs in 3D and then pin them in different colors um, along the natural gradient of color variations, so from the blues to the beiges to the browns, and, and perpendicular to that along a gradient of egg coloration, uh, sort of this deep dark green, uh, uh, um, brownish green uh, uh, to, the, to the purple eggs that don't exist in nature. Um, and of course, you know, Bob Payne will tell me that this egg actually exists because the shining cuckoos lay an egg like that, but it's not quite the same color. Um, and so, so we decided to, to, to generate diversity that exists in nature and diversity that, that doesn't exist in nature. And ask the birds, how will you respond to this? And so this is what the data look like. 
this is the natural diversity of egg colors and this is that brown purple gradient that doesn't exist in nature in the avian color space. It's all within color space, so the birds should be able to tell those differences. But it turns out they don't pay attention to non-existing variation in nature. This is the natural gradient and this you should read as a map with, uh, with elevation gradient. So this is 0.2 rejection rate, 0.3 rejection rate and these rejection rates increase from, uh, uh, from the bluish eggs to the beige eggs. But uh, along the artificial gradient, that brown to uh, 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 that green to purple gradient, there's no elevational change in the rejection rate. It doesn't matter how dissimilar the cuckoo, the host uh, uh, egg is in this case, uh, 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 the birds will respond to it only according to the diversity of just how blue versus how brown that gradient is. Uh. And in fact, they do this asymmetrically. So you could give a blue egg that's four JNDs from the bird's own egg, so much, much bluer than the robin's own egg, and they will accept it. And you could give a bird egg that's two JNDs uh, uh, towards the brown range, and they will immediately uh, reject it. So it looks like uh, b the birds are only paying attention to not only the natural gradients, but only the gradients that are towards the, 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 the parasitic egg's own coloring. In this case, the cowbird's brownish egg uh, uh, phenotype itself, and they, they don't pay attention to the bluishness. Uh, so it's not about the difference between your own eggs and the artificial egg or the, uh, the parasitic eggs, it's just how much browner is that artificial egg in the nest that matters. It turns out that this behavior is repeatable. If you reject an egg uh, one time, you will also more likely to reject it. If you don't reject an egg, you will also more likely not to reject it the next time. So individual repeatability is at least at the, the maximum of heritability. So we are, of course, hoping to breed robins or hendry's robins from females whose egg rejection abilities we have studied and seeing if the juveniles, uh, 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 when they uh, start nesting in captivity, will they also show similar level of rejection. Uh, again, this will get to some genetic basis of egg rejection ability itself. But uh, um, I, I wanted to mention, you know, that study that really turns everybody's mind over. Uh, um, so I wanted to ask the question, why are some of these eggs rejected and why are some of these uh, eggs uh, uh, um, accepted? And so we came up with an alternative that it's not about how similar your own eggs are to the artificial eggs, but maybe it's the contrast between the nest background and the birds or, and the egg itself. So maybe just it's about the, the, contra the visibility of your own egg versus the, the parasitic egg in the nest. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it turns out that those two traits are highly correlated with each other. So in all our, you know, even when you do experiments and you change only one thing, it turns out that visually you actually change multiple things. You don't just change the color of the egg, but you also change the color of the contrast. So we came up with this experiment, which I call the nest cloth experiment where we, we disentangle these two hypotheses. Uh, you can have differences between the eggs and the, and the, of the host egg and the, the parasite egg, or you can have differences between the contrast of the nest and the egg itself. And so I was going to disprove everybody, Steve Rothstein, Nick Davis, you know, the whole textbook on brood parasites. And of course, as my predator, as my predator, as my <laughs> referee has put it, Hauber designed an elegant experiment, but the results are confusing. And so this is a study would you, where you could say both things, that the treatment had an effect and the treatment didn't have an effect. Uh, what it didn't have an effect on is the beige egg is always rejected the most, and the blue egg is always rejected the least, and the red egg is always rejected at intermediate level. But if you look at the, the blue egg, for instance, the rejection rate goes from zero to uh, uh, up to 25, 30% uh, in some cases. 30% rejection is what the great red warblers do against mimetic cuckoo eggs. Uh, um, and rejection rates drop from 100% uh, from uh, down to 70% uh, to in the case of the beige eggs. But overall, we could not use the contrast between the egg and the nest itself as a predictor of the rejection rate itself. This is that non-significant relationship and the only significant effect if the whole experiment was the egg color itself. Steve Rothstein is correct, and Nick Davis is correct, and I'm wrong, um, which is fine. So, so um, uh, th this brings me, you know, sort of the, 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 the last case of, uh, 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 that I wanted to mention, which is um, people have told us uh, uh, that the, the lack of egg rejection in the case of the cowbird host is perhaps due to a, a lack of coevolutionary past 
uh, with the host themselves. You know, there's no egg mimicry, there's low rates of egg rejection. Uh, Cabbers have expanded into the northeast. Uh, the habitat has been modified, and so inner forest species are now uh, exposed to, uh, to cabbers themselves. So I wanted to, 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 to come up with an alternative to that, is, and, uh, and, and that was based on my research in the field, where I found that, uh, that uh, um, if you look at a parasitized nest in year one, 1999, uh, uh, for instance, right here, that nest is also parasitized in 2000, in 2001, and then not in 2002. This nest is, is not parasitized in year one, not in year two, not in year three, but then in year, year uh, four it's parasitized. But overall, there's this pattern of non-transition uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, um, uh, non between parasitized and non-parasitized sites. Uh, even when you compare across 10 years of parasitism history, a nest that was parasitized in 2009 also had a parasitism history back in the 1990s. Uh, uh, and a nest that was not parasitized in 2009 had a, par a low parasitism history in the 1990s, 2000s. Uh, um, so it looks like there's a non-random transition probability. If you're parasitized in year one, you're also likely to be parasitized in year two. If you're not parasitized in year one, you're also likely to be not parasitized in year two. And so, uh, so I built a small model to show that, that the benefit of egg rejection decreases. The difference between the benefits of rejecting an egg and accepting an egg becomes smaller the greater the spatial stru spatial temporal structure in parasitism in, is. And so you know, I found it in, in Phoebes, but I, I hadn't uh, um, uh, uh, color banded my Phoebes. I, I didn't uh, actually individually identify the Phoebes in any way. So I wanted to ask the question whether this uh, 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 type of limited horizontal transmission will, uh, will uh, be more uh, uh, prominent among cabbard hosts than non-hosts. And so I asked Kenya Sukawa to give us some data from his 25-year-plus red wing blackbird study. And he found the same pattern we found in Phoebe's. When you're not parasitized in year one, you're also not parasitized in, in subsequent years. And when you're parasitized in year one, you have a higher chance of being parasitized in, year, in uh, the subsequent year. This is also true for dark-eyed juncos nesting in the San Diego campus, eastern Phoebes nesting in Ontario in the 1960s, and prosonotary warblers um, nesting in southern Illinois. In fact, what we found with Jeff Hoover is that this parasitism uh, uh, history has also impacted mother offspring pairs. It's, it's as if there was vertical transmission of parasitism history. If your mom was not parasitized, you were less than average uh, parasitism rate parasitized uh, as a daughter. And if your mom was parasitized, you were greater than average parasitism uh, uh, rate uh, than the population um, as a daughter yourself, suggesting that there's something of a vertical transmission like parasitism history in the case uh, uh, of, uh, of these warblers. And, uh, and I'm just going to finish this, uh, something that uh, 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 ben and I were talking about is uh, is uh, is how do you how do you uh, uh, um, learn about your habitat preferences? It turns out that when you're a female warbler and your mom uses a nest box that's parasitized, you're doomed for life. You won't come back to parasitize the, to to use the same nest box as mom, but you will start using nest boxes that have a higher chance of being parasitized than non-parasitized. So this is nest box usage outside the natal nest box itself. Uh, and this, again, you know, data from the prosonotary warbler studies of, of southern Illinois. So, so um, I'm excited to be able to come back to this system and ask questions whether we can start considering cowbirds as true agents of diseases. Uh, they are truly parasites and disease-causing organisms in the sense that they reduce the fitness of the host, they cause elimination of, uh, of the breeding attempts or the fitness of the, of the clutch itself. And so we should start thinking about them as, you know, uh, uh, other viruses and, uh, and, uh, and bacteria and ticks and, uh, and mites uh, as agents of uh, disease, as agents of virulence, as agents of, uh, of uh, ecologically and socially transmitted diseases. So I think I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, come and visit us. Uh, we're just in Urbana-Champaign, a mere eight hours away. Uh, uh, but if you ever want to study cowbirds, robins, prosanitary warblers, uh, uh, there's more than cornfields to uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, uh, there's more than soybean fields, too. So uh, I promise. Thank you so much.
And this is my friend Tomas trying to re remove a cuckoo egg from the nest. Uh, um, it's, he actually looks like Tomas too. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two times when egg discrimination for the parasite matters. One of them is does she lay an egg into a nest that matches her own egg? And so what we think um, from the few data that have been uh, uh, produced is that it's not about host-specific imprinting in the cuckoos, uh, but it's habitat imprinting. People have raised cuckoos in dioramas, and in one of the two years that they were tested in, they preferred to sit in front of a diorama where they had grown up. Uh, with the, the indigo birds, of course, it's imprinting on the, on the, on the host song. Sure. No, she will, she will lay in uh, a mismatch. If it's, as long as it's in the same habitat, same, same area, she will parasite. Cowbirds are even worse. They will go for anything if there's nothing available. Um, um, you know, so early in the spring, they will even parasitize house finches, which are totally inappropriate hosts. And they parasitize Phoebes early in the season. Later in the season, they like to parasitize ground nesting warblers. Um, you know, that's their bread and butter. But uh, the other time when, when cuckoo egg recognition matters is, um, is in, is, uh, you know, has been hypothesized as the second evolutionary origin or second evolutionary mechanism for mimicry. If a cuckoo comes back to a nest, she should remove the already existing cuckoo egg from the nest itself. And so, so there are cases with the, sh the shining bronze cuckoos uh, in, in Australia and in New Zealand where that might be the case. The, the cuckoo egg is not actually mimetic but cryptic. It's dark brown or dark blue, dark green, and it's highly invisible in the nest because it's an enclosed nest. And, and so both Naomi Langmore's group and, uh, and uh, uh, Rose Thorogood's uh, 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 group has shown that it's the cuckoo that removes the other cuckoos or the non-mimetic egg from the nest uh, when they play a place a white egg in the nest, but when it's a it's a a, a dark green egg, it, it it's not recognized, and and so that could be another evolutionary origin of why cuckoo egg has to be mimetic. All right, thank you, Mark. Okay, fantastic. thanks.